It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Smooth and Savvy is joined by some of the hottest talent in the entertainment industry. From musicians to authors and all those in between. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here he is, Mr. Smooth and Savvy himself, Douglas Coleman. Well, hello there. How are you? How are you? Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. Thank you for tuning in. We've got another great show for you today. Two interviews. One is an author. First one up. Author's name is Michael Pang, and he has written a book called In the Eyes of Madness, The Declan Peters Chronicles, and it's a young adult paranormal urban fantasy is the genre. He will be up first, followed by Phil Johnson, who is a comedian and musician. He does stand-up, and he plays his guitar and sings very funny, clever songs. Phil has very, very long hair, and part of his routine is that from the back, people often mistake him for a woman, which from the back, I guess one could make that error. Although I think if you see him from the front, you would have to be pretty uh, gender identification challenged not to be able to tell that he was a man. Anyways, it makes for funny comedy, so I'm happy to have Phil here. We'll have one of his songs towards the end of the interview as well. So, we will be right back with Michael Pang. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. In-house production and recording in Louisiana Publishing Company is now offering a special for podcasters on their CD Pro Radio Network. For just $20 a month, CD Pro Radio will broadcast your podcast twice a week on their network. This is a great and inexpensive opportunity for podcasters to gain some exposure for their show without having to spend a lot of money. Please check them out at cdproradio.com. That's cdproradio.com. Okay, please welcome my guest, Michael Pang. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hi, Doug. I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, doing very well. You are an author. I wanted to... uh, ask you first a little about yourself and then we can talk about your book. According to your bio, you were born in Hong Kong and your family immigrated to San Francisco when you were three years old and now you ended up in Florida. Okay, you've been in America for most of your life then if you came here when you were three. Yes, that's correct. Have you been back to Hong Kong since uh, since then? I have. I was actually very lucky to be part of an exchange program back in 2001 during my freshman year of college, and I got to spend eight months in Hong Kong and the University of Science Technology there. And it was it was a beautiful place. I mean, the university itself was located right off of a cliff, and you had perfect views of the ocean right from the dorm room. It was amazing. Well, I love Hong Kong. I've been there a few times, and I think it's just a fabulous city for shopping and for eating. Uh, the food is fabulous, and the shopping is fabulous, and it's just... You know, it's different. I mean, I like the uh, going back and forth between the Hong Kong Island and the Kowloon side. And it's just there's always an adventure there. You know, there's always something going on, something to do. The weather in the winter, I think, is beautiful. Summer's a bit sticky, but uh, usually I try to go when I've gone. I've gone in January, and the weather yeah. was just perfect. That's that's definitely the best time to go. Um, I mean, it's it's low season. It's not quite as crowded, but you don't want to stay too late into January because then you're getting close to Chinese New Year. Then it gets really crazy. Oh, I bet it. Yeah, I know. I've never stayed there for Chinese New Year, but uh, I'll have to remember that <laughs> not to go during that time. <laughs> I did want to ask you one thing about you speak Cantonese and Mandarin, correct? That's correct. I'm curious about, and I think that people who are native English speakers have confusion about dialect, about the term dialect, because we don't really have dialects, particularly of English. English is a dialect of like Indo-European languages from thousands of years ago. But Chinese has many dialects, and 
how do you define that? Tell me what your definition of a dialect is. Like, what would be the difference between well, Cantonese and Mandarin? Because the written is the same, right? The written is the same, and it, it's it's somewhat understandable, um, except that there's certain Cantonese words that isn't used in Mandarin. So I kind of look at it as um, maybe like Portuguese, Italian, Spanish. You know, you, we all use the same Roman characters, right? Mo Roman alphabets. However, certain ways you pronounce the words would be different depending on which language it's in, uh, whether it's Portuguese or Spanish. Well, that's the same way I look at um, in as in a, a Chinese dialect. The written language is the same. You could you could kind of read it, um, but when you pronounce the words, it will sound completely different. So that's different than an accent, though. No, it, it, yeah, it's definitely different. For example, um, in Mandarin, there is four tones um, to every sound, and in Cantonese, there's actually nine. Oh. So it, yeah, so you know something that sounds like a homonym. There's actually nine different tones for it, and you know uh, maybe for an example, um, in I was teaching my daughter, you know, how to say mom and grandma in um, in Cantonese, and it to her, she can't tell the difference. You know, like in in Cantonese, grandmother is ma, and um and mom is ma, and you can and horse ma. It all sounds the same, right? But it's a different <laughs> tone. It's actually depending on the pitch you're, you're you're at, it tells you what word it is. Okay, um, because I taught English for three years in Thailand, and I know that in the Thai language has five tones, and I could never figure them out. I could never hear the difference. <laughs> and it's funny you say ma because that's the same word in Thai for horse mm -hmm. and it's also the same word for dog but it's just a different tone that will distinguish between dog and horse. And they yeah. said that um, I said well what's the difference and they said well that the the horse tone is higher because it's a bigger animal which is logical but I couldn't. I couldn't tell the difference if they were talking about a dog or a horse. Yeah, I, I, and in Cantonese, it, it gets even more complicated than that. It's not just like a high pitch. It's oh, it starts at a high pitch, but then it ends at a low pitch, <laughs> oh, yeah. and it would be a different word. And there are reportedly ten thousand plus Chinese characters in the language. Is that correct? Yes, which makes it very, very difficult language to learn to read. I mean, it's almost like reading a hieroglyph, right? Certain symbols put together makes the word. Well, if 10,000 characters, I mean, would you know them all? Yeah, there's probably like, maybe like a good, you know, 1,000, where it's like, if you know that those are basically the common ones you'd use in language. And then there's like certain variations to certain words. So, for example, if, if you put like a certain symbol next to it, it would change the tone a little and change the meaning just slightly. All right. Well, that's very informative. I'm uh, one of those people just like you. You said on your thing, you said, I'm a seeker of knowledge. If there's something that interests you, you always want to try to find out exactly what it was. So I thought I would take the opportunity because I was always curious about dialects and about the, the Chinese language anyways. So thank you for that. <laughs> now I've learned something today. I can go to sleep and be happy. When did you start writing? When was that? When did that happen? Because that wasn't what you started out doing, right? No, no, definitely not. I mean, I've always been interested in writing. I mean, I, I've i written, um, you know, since grade school, just, you know, different stories that turn in as different assignments. And, you know, I would love those assignments just because, I, you know, I was a natural storyteller. As a matter of fact, um, when I was in middle school, there was a program where, you know, I can get involved and be a storyteller to the elementary school kids. And I loved doing that. I, I just love doing storytelling. So, um, you know, as I got older, you know, I got more focused on career and so forth. Um, I kind of lost, I guess, kind of got out of a lot of the writing, but I did still continue to read a lot. I'm a very avid reader. And it wasn't until I had my firstborn. Uh, she was probably about four months at the time. And, you know, apparently when you have a lack of sleep, you, you have very strange, vivid dreams. And I had a really awkward dream where I was walking around in a in a uh, mental asylum, and you know some of the thoughts that were going through my mind were, you know, like what's going on with these people because they're not just 
acting erratically, there's certain strange phenomenon going around them. And, you know, my thoughts were like, are these people really crazy or are they possessed? And my dream came to a really abrupt end as I walked into a room and um, I saw like an orderly working there and he's calling one of the patients his mom and then all of a sudden she turns it on and attacks her. And I, I just woke up. I mean, I, I, man, that was a creepy dream for me. And, you know, the next morning I, it was still in my head and very clear too, which was strange because I, I rarely have vivid dreams like that. And, um, I told my wife about it and I was like, man, I wanted to go back to sleep and find out what happens to the boy. And, but I, I couldn't. And my wife's like, well, you know, <laughs> you like to read and you like to write. Why don't you just write an ending yourself? And I was like, huh, maybe I will. So you actually dreamt the story. Yes. Well, yes. that's pretty cool. Now, is the boy you or? No. <laughs> no. No, it, it, like, it, what's really weird, you know, when you're dreaming, a lot of times you don't even know who you are, right? You're just kind of, kind of an observer. Okay. Yeah. Maybe for some people, for me, I'm always me in the dream. And it's very strange oh. because, like, I have weird dreams too. Um, but there are always some constants in my dreams, like, uh, my father has been passed away for 30 years. But in my dream state, he's always there. He's never dead. And oh, it, wow. it doesn't matter if he is, like, in the dream particularly. You know, he could be wherever he is, and I could be wherever I am in the dream. But in, in my conscious, in my dream conscious, he's, you know, over there somewhere. He's not dead. So that's always a constant. But no, I'm always me for some reason. I'm always conscious that it's <laughs> you know coming from my my perspective i never dreamt i was someone else particularly that, that's really you know i i'm doing some reading because like i said i i am like you i'm a seeker of knowledge and you know with the with the age of the internet that's like oh, it's like heaven I mean, piece of like, cake you can look up anything i know it's great yeah exactly and and i think there's this thing called um lucid dreaming where where people are are able to dream and they they are aware that they're in a dream, you know, at certain stages or level of awareness, you're able to know that you're in a dream so much that you can control what's going on in the dream. And, you know, it, it's like this phenomenon that a lot of people are like, or I guess, new agey that people are kind of after. <laughs> well, there was that movie. Did you see the movie Inception? One of my favorite movies. Yes. Yes, that was really cool. Yeah. And that was sort of based on that. Some Eastern philosophies believe that your dream state is no different than your awake state. It's just another state of mind, that it's equally as real as your awake state. So there's there's a lot of sort of theory about dreams. Some people say that it's way to, that you're connecting to the other side. You know, they, they can get a little far out with it sometimes. But <laughs> I take an open mind to all of it because I don't have an answer yes or no. There's no yeah. way I can confirm or deny that, you know, if they're saying that that's your connection to the other side, I go, oh, well, that's no good. I don't believe that. I wouldn't say that because I don't have, you know, a definite answer. And I'm one of these guys that's sort of very, I like to see it proven <laughs> for me to believe it. Otherwise, I stick it in the uh, I don't know file. There is a lot going on with dreams, though, and it's always interesting. People have been trying to... Uh, figure out what that's been about. Basically, you just wrote the backstory to this dream. Is it you kind of filled in around it? Kind of. And kind of this dream is the backstory to Declan. Oh, I see. So, okay. Yeah, actually, this dream is is actually captured in, in chapter one of the book. And then the rest kind of tells well, what happens to him afterwards. Like, and then, you know, slowly reveal reveals throughout the story, you know, what led him to the point. I mean, you don't find a a young teenager working inside of a mental asylum, you know, as, you know, as readily as that. Now, you've got this listed as the uh, Declan Peters Chronicles, so I'm assuming there's going to be more books? Yes. Yes, definitely. So book one is out. How long has book one been out? Book has been out for about a year now. About a year. Okay. How's it doing? It's doing well. It's doing well. It, it, it actually, um, you know, hit the number one spot a couple of times. Um, in the Christian young adult, uh, fantasy fiction category, which on Amazon, which, uh, which was really exciting. But, you know, it, it usually stays there for about a week and then drops off. <laughs> so just depending on what kind of 
uh, marketing promotion we're doing on it. So now you were self-published. Yes. You've got something else on here that I wanted to ask you about because I don't even know what it is. It okay. says you're very involved in activities at your local project management institute chapter. Sounds very exciting, but what is it? <laughs> so, so there's a professional organization called Project Management Institute, and basically it's um, a professional organization for project managers. So uh, we, sh you know, we do a lot of knowledge share, we do a lot of training, and so forth for um, you know other project managers or people who are looking into getting to project management and so forth. So there's a there's actually a professional credential called the PMP, the Professional Project Manager that is um, given out by this organization. And, you know, you have to have like 4,500 hours as a project manager. You have to take a four hour exam and so forth. Um, and then you're presented with this credential. So uh, in our organization, we do a lot of training and stuff like that for people who are looking to get that those credentials. Okay, I'm still confused. What kind of projects do you work on? Uh, okay, so um, the organization is, is pretty much across all the different industries. So healthcare has a lot of projects, for example. Um, you know, when you go to see a doctor, they're all using, you know, some sort of computer. They're entering your, your information on there. Well, you know, that system was, you know, organized and coordinated by a project manager to implement at that, you know, local clinic that you're at, um, you know, throughout software development, uh, you need project managers to help, um, you know, get communication between what the customer wants and then going with the development team to talk about the uh, requirements and then build, come together with a project plan to how to deliver this program to um, your customer. Um, and, you know, when I was in Siemens Energy, you know, I was doing project management where, you know, we're creating the next product line in gas turbines or uh, there could be a service project where we're developing some sort of adaptable piece to an existing part um, that can help, you know, the customer either get more efficiency out of their turbines or what have you. So it, it's, it's pretty across the industry. I mean, project management is actually even, you know, used very heavily if you think, you know, about it in the publishing industry too. It takes, there's a lot of work that needs to go into it to getting a book together, you know, from, uh, of course, the author writing the book to him working with a few illustrators and so forth, coming up with a book cover, then working with a book formatter, and then having the book being published, and then working with a bunch of marketing uh, people and working with publicists and so forth. I mean, it's it's a huge project that, you know, if you have one person that helps coordinate all the different efforts towards the same goal, then you have a better chance of delivering a better product. Okay, so a project is basically a generic term, and it could relate to any project that somebody might have yes. or some corporation might have. Yes. Okay. I was reading it as specific, and I thought, wait a minute, what project? <laughs> I was kind of uh, misreading that. Okay, now I get it. Uh, let's see, what else? You also love kids. You've got two daughters. How old are your daughters? So I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, both girls. Oh, wow. And they never stop talking. <laughs> the other one that was interesting is you said you love to cook. What kind of things oh, do you cook? I love to cook, and I love to eat. What sort of things do you cook? I cook everything i mean just from um french cuisine to chinese to japanese i i love to eat so i think those usually go hand in hand if you like to eat you like to cook because a lot of times you know you go out and you're kind of disappointed you're like i could cook this for like a tenth of the cost why am i out at this restaurant so um you know i, I think it kind of started um my mom was an excellent cook grown up so when i went off to college I mean, you're, you're kind of stuck with dorm food with, with, you know, the, yeah, <laughs> uh, dorm whatever dining halls at the yeah. dormitory and, and they're usually not that great. No. So, you know, I, I had a hard time adjusting. I was just so used to my mom's cooking. So I started, you know, calling mom like, Hey, how do you make this? How do you make that? And going to grocery stores and cooking it for myself. And, you know, it just became a habit. And even after I got married, um, you know, my, my wife, um, she didn't grow up like cooking a lot either. She didn't grow, grow up cooking a lot. So she, it wasn't a, a natural inkling for her. So, you know, actually the first couple of years of our marriage when she was working uh, full time as a, a public accountant, uh, she was working you know, 60, 80 hours a week. So naturally I did the cooking uh, and it wasn't until she was a stay at home mom that she really developed her cooking skills. What is your favorite food then? Can you pin one or are there two? Yes. Many? Okay. There's nothing I like to eat more than foie gras. 
oh my gosh, like a nice piece of pan seared foie gras. <laughs> and then uh, oh. on a nice buttery brioche with some sort of berry reduction. Oh, my God. Oh, well, that sounds great. I yeah. happen to be a big fan of escargot. I know some people find it nauseating, but if, oh. it's, if it's done right, I think it's wonderful. Yep, I agree. One of the questions on here that I wanted to re-ask, you sent me a list of about 20-some-odd questions. Were these questions that you came up with, or did somebody else come up with them for you in a previous interview? Since my book has been released, I mean, I, I've probably done a good seven to ten blog interviews. So, you know, usually the blogger sends me a list of five to ten questions, and, you know, I'm answering it all, and it usually gets posted in their, in their blog. Oh, all right. Well, one of them that I wanted to ask you, and I'm going to re-ask you, but I want you to give me th three different answers. <laughs> okay. And it's the one about being stranded on a desert island. <laughs> now, the three questions, the three answers that you gave were very sort of, uh, necessitative. I suppose that's the right word. Those would be things that you would just bring because you need to survival. Okay. But I want you to answer that three things that you wouldn't necessarily need to survive, but that you would really want to have with you. <laughs> That's really hard. Um, oh, come on. Yeah, Not animate that. objects? Well, anything. Books, CDs, a phone, you know. Okay, so if there was a place to recharge, I would definitely bring my phone. <laughs> well, okay, let's just say that it's solar powered, you know. I mean, we can take, okay. we can make this a fantasy too. Yeah, I, yeah, if it's solar powered, even if I have no, you know, connection on the phone, I mean, I would still want it because. You know, at least my pictures of my family and so forth was there. You know, if I was stranded by myself, I mean, to me, there's nothing more important than family. And, you know, the whole idea of getting stuck on an island and I can never see the rest of my family again, I think that's probably the greatest tragedy, you know, I can imagine. So, yeah, so a phone um, with that on there. And then, um, of course, with my phone, my Kindle apps on there. So all my books are go. on there too, okay. which is really important because I, I love reading. And, um, you know, for me, it's, you know, I, I have to chase my, my, uh, my book series. So I have to read all of that. And, um, I guess, um, one more item that would be a necessity would be a, maybe a really good fry pan because I like to cook. Oh, there you go. Although there probably wouldn't be much to cook <laughs> on the desert island, but, uh, you know, I mean, you could find fish, probably. Yeah. Yeah. I could probably find fish, you know, which is good. I, I love cooking fish anyway, you know, searing a nice piece of, you know, a uh, fillet of salmon or what have you. And then, you know, just finding some rocks, putting that pan on there, putting fire in me. I can make it happen. All right. I like those answers. Those are good. I want to go back to your book for a second because the book has, some paranormal, I don't, I want to say paranormal activity. Your book has some paranormal, uh, features in it. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. What yes. sort of, now this is in the mental institution. So just to kind of paint a picture for people, what kind of paranormal yeah. stuff have you thrown in there? You know, certain patients when they, when they go a little, they have a little episode, um, you know, they'll find themselves with, you know, super speed super strength, which isn't always, you know, too out of the norm, right? I mean, certain bursts of adrenaline, you know, can be explained away. But that that's kind of what this book want to examine, right? You know, is this really something that supernaturally happened? Or when they happen, do we just out of denial explain it away, you know, with something scientific? So you're leaving it up to the reader whether or not it really happened. It's kind of like the premise of the book that these things are here and they are supernatural, but everybody would be like, well, you know, then why didn't we know about this? Why isn't this something that's proven? Oh, well, that's because, you know, people's natural inclination is to deny and explain it away with something scientific. Okay, you've got a few characters listed here. Uh, Declan, we talked about, he's the lead. Just tell us quickly who the other ones are. The Tristan, Zoe. Yes, so, yep, so, uh, so there, there's kind of, five leads in the book but of course mainly is Declan um, so there is Kira and her brother Caleb uh, which you know they grew all three of them they grew up together and they're their best friends and they would do anything for one another uh, and then there is these two odd siblings uh, which were the Sullivans which is Zoe and Tristan 
and their stories tie together uh, in the way that they can do certain supernatural things. And, you know, they were always raised um, by their parents, teaching them that, hey, you know, you're from this certain bloodline, and therefore you can do all these amazing things. But in the beginning of the book, their parents die. And they're questioning all of these things that they were taught. You know, I don't want to give too much of it away, but it makes them question whether or not their parents really were the good guys or the bad guys. Well, if you want to find out what happens to Declan and Tristan and Zoe, please pick up the book In the Eyes of Madness by Michael Pang. It's on Amazon and Kindle, I presume. Yep, Kindle, yep, uh, Barnes and Noble. How is book two doing? So book two is underway. Uh, it will most likely be released sometime next year. I'm actually, the way I'm doing it, I'm actually writing three separate book series at the same time. And all three actually intermingles and, and crosses over to one another. So this book it is mainly about, you know, Declan and his, I guess, his path towards uh, becoming an exorcist. And in the book, it, it talks about another group that also fights these supernaturally dark creatures called Hunters, which is going to be a different series um, with a different protagonist. And that book is probably going to be released sometime early next year or, be, or end of this year. Uh, and it's, it's going to be the Hunter's Way uh, series. And then there's going to be a third book series that is kind of um, the setting is in the biblical times where it examines the origin of demons. Do you have a website you want to mention? Yeah, it's uh, in the eyes of madness.com. Well, Michael, thank you. Unfortunately, our time is up for the interview. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for explaining about uh, the dialects of Cantonese and Mandarin. I appreciate that. And best of luck with the book. I hope it does well. Thank you so much, Doug. It was such a pleasure being on the show. And, you know, I wish you the best of luck and I wish the best for the show. Thank you very much. And now... Hey, Rocky! Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat! Again? Rock enough must leave! Crystal! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat! Now here's something we hope you'll really like! Okay, please welcome my guest, Phil Johnson. Hi, Phil. How are you? Hello. Good to hear from you, Douglas. Yes, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I guess I'm gonna call you a stand-up comic, yeah? Is that your title? Yeah, that seems to be the definition these days, anyway. I, it took me a long time to kind of... Uh, acknowledge that idea but yeah i think that's i think that's what i call myself mostly because i saw a couple of your youtube clips they were really hysterical i, <laughs> I have to admit <laughs> i was uh, chuckling yes the whole thing about looking like a woman was very funny but you know personally to me you don't look like a woman you just look <laughs> like a, a guy with long hair and right <laughs> you know i grew up in the 70s and we all had long hair back then that was the look um, there you go. Yeah, it was funny because that bit really took me a long time to get around to doing it the right way. And I mean, because I've always had uh, the guys flirting with me on the freeway or the waiter that walks up behind us and goes, what can I get you, ladies? Or or the, the guy that walks into the bathroom while I'm in the sink and has to do a double take at the sign on the door, you know, <laughs> so I've always had that. But it really took me um, took me about seven or eight years of doing comedy to figure out how to approach that in, in an interesting enough way to make it a bit. And, and everybody loves that bit. So it's uh, still in the show. <laughs> well, now, how long did it take you to grow your hair? Because looking at the video, it looks like it's down to about your ass. Is that about where it is? Yeah, that's that's about right. I haven't cut it in a long time. I don't think I've cut it in, uh, I don't know, 20 years or so. Wow. Um, started growing it when I was 16, but uh, it doesn't grow much anymore. It hasn't grown in a long time. But yeah, it's a it's about down to the waist. Now, that must be uh, a lot of maintenance, though, to keep hair like that, you yeah? know? Nah, not really. I use cheap shampoo, brush it once a day. I'm good to go. Uh, it's pretty, it's it's low lower maintenance than it seems like it should be. I've never had hair that long. The, I mean, in the 70s, the longest I had was shoulder length. And my hair was one of that kind of hair where once it got to a certain length, it started to curl, you know? Oh, yeah. And I could just never get it to grow straight down, so I said, oh, forget uh -huh. it. Uh-huh. So I yeah. <laughs> had it at shoulder length and, you know, and now these days it's a uh, number two buzz, you know, so it's uh, very, very short and no maintenance, but 
Yeah. I grew it out as a teenager and I was a metalhead and, and started playing in bands and all that stuff and it made sense there. And then when I sort of moved over into comedy accidentally, it was something that made me stand apart from all the other, all the other, you know, white guy comics and hoodies is, uh, you know, people walk in and they go, oh, it's the guy with the hair and the shirt. And they remember because nobody ever remembers the comedian's name. Uh, I, you can go, ah, I saw the greatest comedian the other night and you go, who was it? And I go, ah, I don't remember his name. So it, having a visual something on stage uh, really allows them to remember me better. Do you do uh, comedy connections and comedy clubs and open mics and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I don't uh, I don't do open mics as much anymore. Um, I've been I've been doing the comedy thing for about 12 years now and I just it's hard to stomach an open mic where there's three people who aren't listening anyway. <laughs> and uh, I, so I mostly, if I'm rehearsing, I'll I'll talk to my couch a lot. My couch has heard my jokes uh, more times than anybody. Um, but then I go, I'll go filter new material into a longer set. If I'm doing an hour uh, or something on stage, it might be, you know, uh, ten minutes of new material somewhere in that hour, so that I've got a chance to work that out and it's sandwiched in between stuff that already works. Okay, now you also are a musician. Yep. And you use your guitar as part of your comedy routine. I do, yeah. Well, I have a degree in jazz, uh, oh, in jazz wow. guitar, and uh, my professors are, uh, I'm sure, so proud of me because now I tell dick jokes for a living. But <laughs> I, uh, I've been a musician since I was, uh, since I was eight, many instruments, all that kind of stuff. So I happened to write a couple of funny songs after I had, uh, I had split up with some of the guys that I was playing with at the time, and I was just kind of just dumping song ideas onto tape. And a couple of them came out to be these like goofy, humorous, funny songs that the the old guys had never wanted to do. They always wanted to be real serious. And so I went to uh, a music convention in Las Vegas. And one night we were sitting around the pool and just playing songs for each other. And I played a song called Whale Blubber, which is a love song. And uh, the next morning, everybody was like, oh, my God, we can't get that stupid Whale Blubber song out of her head. That's what you should be doing. And I was like, no, 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 no. That's that's ridiculous. B-side stuff, you know. And, uh, the, and, but they kept pushing me, pushing me, pushing me. And I had two other funny songs. And so I got invited to do this comedy music show in San Francisco at a place called the Hyena Theater. That's not there anymore. And somebody saw me there, the lady that was emceeing, her name was Lynn Ruth Miller, uh, who is, I believe, currently the oldest comedian working. She's 83. Wow. And, uh, which I think she was 71, uh, when I met her. And, uh, so she was like, oh, I need a guitar player in my act. Why don't you come play guitar for my act and we'll see if we can get you some sets. And I was like, all right. So I was doing things like uh, she's 71 at the time. She's doing a strip tease uh, to anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols. Oh it was hilarious. <laughs> and uh, that was that was part of her act. So we did that. We took that to Edinburgh, Scotland, all sorts of stuff. And uh, but I started getting people were like, oh, you got you got some stuff. Get on stage. And they're like, can you do five minutes? And I'm like, I played four hours with my band the other night. And then you realize how long five minutes is in comedy. Terribly long, uh, especially when it's not working. But it, uh, it sort of snowballed from there. I had three songs. And then I started catching flack from all the traditionalists who were like, oh, you're not a real stand-up. And so I started learning how to do stand-up. I'd always been a fan. I just never thought I'd be doing it. And uh, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. It opened up all sorts of new venues for me and things like that. And it just kind of clicked with people. And it's fun. So that's uh, it was all a happy accident. So you were a serious jazz guitar player before all of this? I was a... Uh, a very unserious jazz guitar player. Okay. Uh, they, I was a jazz. I was a jazz major in school because they didn't offer a degree in rock music. Pretty much, um, I was a classical guy as a kid. Uh, you know, teenage years was all metal and hard rock and stuff like that. And uh, and jazz. I mostly played the blues and funk in college, and they. Uh, I managed to avoid re a lot of the really hardcore jazz stuff because my taste in jazz ends at about 1945. And um, but uh, yeah, that's that was my concentration was was jazz guitar. And uh, but I think my senior recital, we just went in and put on a rock concert. Well, it's just an interesting mental image picture because I'm thinking jazz guitar. So immediately Joe Pass comes to mind. You know, sure. he's probably one of the greater jazz guitar players. And then having Joe Pass sort of morph into somebody like Red Peters, who <laughs> who did those strange, yep. you know, you've heard of some of his stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's just a, an amazing uh, picture in my head. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I was... I was never I was always the guy that stuck out anyway that's always been sort of a main theme in my life my first instrument was the flute and I was a I was a flautist for 15 years pretty regularly playing in orchestras and things like that so yeah I definitely stood out in the woodwind section of an 80 piece orchestra I hate that term flautist it just sounds mm. you know it's like when people used to say pianist you know I, yeah, I would yeah. rather they say pianist um, yeah <laughs> flautist is like the, the guy who collects stamps the philatelist 
You know, that that's, right, yeah. that sounds pretty <laughs> disgusting, too. Um, it does sound like he should be arrested for that. Yeah, yeah at least in public. <laughs> One of the things on your bio, I loved your bio, by the way. It's very funny. Um, oh, thanks. That I just wanted to talk a little bit about, if you wouldn't mind. You said you poke holes in the medical marijuana argument. Now, what mm. exactly do you mean by that? Is that pro or, oh. or con? I, I couldn't figure that out. Oh, I am uh, and sort of neither, and really, because I'm I'm not a pot smoker. People assume, assume that I am uh, because of the way I look. And again, that just goes into, I mean, a lot of that that special that that bio was written for was about how I'm not the guy that everybody thinks I am. And um, so when I say, by the way, I'm not a pot smoker, the audience never believes me. So I have to go in and and uh, do some jokes about. Uh, here's why I'm not a pot smoker. You know, uh, I, I, I'm not a guy that likes to be altered in any way uh, because I, I forget things already. I don't need any help to do that. <laughs> and, uh, I make bad choices without any help from drugs. So, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I talk about how, you know, uh, the idea that I'm always hearing that uh, marijuana is is uh, medicine. And uh, oh, what was it? Oh, uh, uh, oh, they, you know, back in the 1800s, uh, marijuana was prescribed as medicine. I go, yes, yeah, so it was cocaine, opium and leeches. <laughs> Mary, 1800 is not exactly the golden age of medical advice you know no, so things not. like that but yeah it's just to kind of contradict the look and throw people off guard from what they expect because as soon as i walk on stage they have some definite expectations of who i'm going to be and what i'm going to do and i like to uh shatter all those expectations as much as possible in the first 10 minutes of the show and then we can go do anything we want after that i want to jump around a little bit usually i start at the beginning sure. but in this case i started at the end and so we'll work our way back tell me <laughs> a little bit about your growing up as a kid did you have this in mind that this is what you were going to do with yourself or did you have no idea what you were going to do uh, I had different ideas about what I was going to do. Um, it's funny because my brother and I both ended up in the arts. My brother is a uh, uh, actor, composer, voiceover artist, things like that. And so we, we both ended up in this industry uh, growing up. My mother always goes, I don't know what happened. You guys were going to be a physicist and a psychologist when you were kids. And uh, and that was kind of the plan. My brother took off on a different route earlier than I did. But I was a physics major in college for the first couple of years. Um, and, uh, when it was when I failed calculus three again, uh, that I decided <laughs> physics probably wasn't the best place for me to be. Um, but I still find it interesting and I still read about all that kind of stuff and things like that, but I find my brain hard to wrap around some of it. But yeah, so I, uh, I mean, I started playing music when I was eight, um, mostly because my mom told me girls like musicians and, uh, she said, if you play the flute, you'll always be the only boy in the section. And I always was. And, uh, so that's how it started. And uh, it wasn't until I started playing guitar when I was 16 that I really kind of uh, thought, hmm, I think I want to be in a band. And I didn't even start a band until college. Uh, I started it with a guy named Brandon. We were both dating the same girl. And uh, she introduced us, and we started a band. And uh, and then we just kind of went from there. And as once I got into it, then I was dead serious about, you know, making it, being the rock star, playing. All I ever wanted to be was a guitar player in a rock band. And uh, somehow I ended up as a singing comedian, which doesn't make any sense. But yeah, early on, it was I was going to be a physicist. Well, I'm glad you uh, picked up the guitar because I can't imagine that a flute player would attract a lot of the chicks. You know, that, that doesn't seem like the greatest instrument for the uh, sex appeal. I don't know. Guitar no, players. You'd be are, surprised. Strong lips. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. It never occurred to me that, oh, if I want to get chicks, I should start playing the flute. <laughs> guitar is is more uh, more appropriate for that yeah i think the guitar or drummer or bass actually any instrument in a rock band you know right yep okay so what was your first professional gig do you remember that oh i do i mean as a kid i hated doing recitals like with a passion hated doing recitals and uh now i, I now i think it's freudian and i'm just reliving the traumas of my childhood every night but I, uh, we had, uh, been rehearsing together, my band Roadside Attraction. We'd been rehearsing together for about a year, year and a half. Uh, I don't know. We had uh, four or five songs, something like that. And still looking back sounded terrible still. And, uh, my bass player called up one of the local clubs here in San Jose. It was a place called the Cabaret. And, uh, he just wanted, he was like, Oh, we're just interested in finding out how we get booked at your club. And the guy was like, yeah, do you want a headline October 18th or whatever the date was? And, and it was like a Saturday night. And he's like, yes. <laughs> and he comes to rehearsal. He's like, uh, we got a Saturday headlining date. And we're like, what? And, uh, so we, uh, 
just out of it was it was sort of a, we had to sell tickets and all that kind of stuff and uh so the the club really didn't care who was on the stage as long as they sold tickets it was that kind of joint and uh so we get there but we got that we decided we were gonna have a big show so all of our favorite bands had like uh you know like intro music like a big flashy intro sound collage kind of thing right and so we put together this horrendous sounding uh introduction on tape and we brought it into the uh we didn't know anything we didn't know any we'd never done this before and so we took it into the club and uh we like trying to play it mic it in a boom box on stage and the sound guy comes up and he goes what the hell are you doing and we're like oh it's our intro he goes give me that he takes the tape up and he puts it in the in the sound booth recorder and he plays it and we're like, oh, man, this sounds amazing over this huge sound system. And it finishes. And he goes, that is the longest, most boring introduction I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. And you're not using it. <laughs> and we're like, all right, we're not using it. <laughs> and uh, so I think we sold, I don't know, 80 tickets or something for that first gig because any band can do that for their first gig. And uh, and uh, yeah, I remember I, my knees were shaking. I could barely stand up. I had to wait in the green room because I wasn't old enough to be in the club. I think I was only 19 or 20, something like that. Uh-huh. And uh, so I had to I had to watch the whole show with my neck craned sideways from the green room until we went on. Um, but it was uh, terrifying and exhilarating. And it's one of those things where you go, well, I have a new addiction now. Let's let's see how far we can take this. So that was your first gig as a band, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And what was your first uh, comedy gig? Uh, that would that would have been I mean my first official comedy gig was that one at the Hyena Theater. Uh, it was a musical comedy show that a friend of mine uh she had sent me an email. She goes, hey, they're doing this thing over at this theater. Maybe you should try and get on it. And they put me on. And I had all of three comedy songs. And uh, I went up there. I think I did four songs maybe. And uh, it was it was just I mean I still have a recording of that set and, and it makes me cringe to listen to it. But it was just enough to kind of get my foot in the door with a couple other people in the comedy scene who started inviting me other places. But uh, that one, I wasn't as nervous uh, because I wasn't, I had gone uh, kind of gone through this middle period of I was both playing with my band and doing solo gigs in coffee houses and things like that. So I had at that point at least gotten used to being on stage by myself. And um, it, uh, so that one was just uh, a change of venue, really. I was pretty much doing the same show, which was interesting. People always go, you know, how'd you get into comedy? I'm like, well, I didn't kind of, accidentally got in comedy and it was just really another venue with a different kind of audience in it but i'd already been tromping around stages for long enough that it didn't freak me out too bad by that point now are you making a living at this or do you do something else i don't have a regular job and haven't for probably 20 years now but i uh i do i'm on the road doing comedy about two weeks out of the month i also teach music when i'm at home i do some voiceover work i do some music licensing i do some writing uh i do a lot of different things because I have worked with a lot of comics who are the 30, 35 year old road dogs who have been at it forever. And they're like, I hate doing comedy now and I don't know how to do anything else. And I don't have any other way of making money. And I'm like, Ooh, I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy, you know? So I tend to keep myself busy with lots of different projects. I got my thumb in a lot of different pies um, so that there's always income coming in. As long as I don't have to wear a necktie or sit in a cubicle, I'm happy. If it's creative, I'm happy to do it. That's really very true. And I'm kind of the same way as you with, I'll do anything, you know, I'll do editing, I'll write, I'll sing, sure. I'll dance. What? Well, no, I won't dance, but, um, <laughs> you know, but anything in the creative realm is fine. I did that 20 years sitting in a cubicle already. And so I'm long done with that. that yep, yep. Yeah. They just, they don't mesh, you know, the creative minds and that type of schedule, it just, it doesn't happen. I mean, my creative ability went to zero for that 20 years, uh-huh. and I had to kind of dig it back up. I sort of buried right. it. And I'm glad I'm back to it now, but uh, it was really a very miserable period in my life. That was the one problem is that I couldn't do both. You know, a lot of people like the thing in New York, I remember when I was there was, you know, you ask them what they do for a living, and they say, well, I'm a singer, I'm a dancer, I'm an actor, and I'm a waiter. And uh-huh. I could never do that. I could either be the waiter or I could be the singer, dancer, actor. For some reason, doing one right. shut down the other side of the brain. I don't know why. Yeah, that makes sense. There's something here on Hawaii that I wanted to ask you about because okay, I've uh, lived in Hawaii sort of off and on, uh, not for long periods of time, but several times for short periods of time. And I just want to hear uh-huh. your, your take on it because I certainly have an opinion about the place. 
So yeah. <laughs> tell me, tell me about well, we, Hawaii as in paradise as we think. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we, we were there. I'm, I'm not a, like a beachy person to begin with. And, uh, but we were there for my brother's wedding and I'm, I'm pretty sure they just had their wedding there hoping that nobody would show up to it. And, and, uh, but of course my parents weren't going to miss that. So, uh, we went out there, me and my girlfriend and my parents and, um, it was just like, I mean, my job is to find the funny in things. And when we got back, my girlfriend called me from work and she was like, Oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm writing Hawaii jokes. And she was like, Well, I didn't find anything funny about Hawaii. And I said, Well, it's, it's kind of my job to do that. It's, that's what my business card says. And, uh, so I was just at where it, the, where it originally came up with was, I think I was looking at the, a book about the Hawaiian alphabet, which only has 13 letters. At the time, I thought it only had 12, and I was corrected by a Hawaiian friend of mine who yelled at me while I was on stage, it's got 13, idiot! And I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but I was looking to see which letters they didn't have. And uh, so the big joke big joke okay. in that uh, in that act is I do uh, I do a couple of jokes about the, the, the language, uh, how the names are all really, really long because there's only 13 letters and things like that. It's a very visual joke. And, uh, uh, and then I say, I can make jokes about the Hawaiian language, and they can't say shit because they don't have an S. <laughs> and that's the big applause break in there but i do i do some jokes about uh about the food and i do some jokes about um uh oh pearl harbor because we went to visit pearl harbor and it's just overrun with japanese tourists which i thought was super awkward and uh so yeah it's just things like that where it's just observational kind of stuff it's super ironic that they all want to come yes. and see that <laughs> one thing about you said about the food in hawaii the food in hawaii is just downright weird I mean, yes. the, the rice with the macaroni salad, it's like, who uh -huh. the hell put that together, you know? Yeah, well, there was a thing. My girlfriend was super – she was super into trying the Spam Musubi because she likes Spam for some weird reason. Oh. And uh, she thought it was horrible. But I was like, oh, it's a, it's a sticky rice with a slab of Spam on top wrapped in seaweed. That's like redneck sushi. It, it is, yeah. Makes me, yeah, it, makes me think of a Japanese guy in a Camaro with a mullet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, with the with the Japanese flag in the back instead of the deer scene, you know. Right. Yep. <laughs> that is just the strangest thing, spam. I mean, that, I wouldn't feed that to my dog. You know that that stuff no. is just disgusting. I have no idea what it's made of. It looks like ham. It's the same color as ham. It's the uh -huh. same continuity. That's not the word I was looking for. What's the word I was looking for? <laughs> Consistency. Consistency. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I like continuity better, I think. <laughs> um, and it's so salty. I mean, there's enough salt in that yeah. to uh, send your blood pressure right through the roof. Yeah. I think my girlfriend likes it because her mom used to make it for her when she was a kid. That was the other one. Spam fried rice. I saw that yep. all over the place. Spam fried rice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She was all over that. Yeah. My girlfriend's Chinese, so she's, uh, she, oh, okay. she's all over that kind of stuff. Well, one of the things, I guess my take on Hawaii wasn't quite as comical as yours. Mine was more on the pathetic side because <laughs> I, I thought it was the dream, the postcard. Uh -huh. And when you live there for a while, you really get to see that it's not. It's also yeah. very isolating. You know, when I lived there, I was like dying to go, dying to get up. Yeah. Because you could get in the car, you could drive around the island in two hours, and that was right. it. So, I mean, now I live in Nevada where you can drive for uh, 12 hours and see nothing but dirt. And it's beautiful. Right. <laughs> you know, I love it. I think a lot of places are that way where they're, you know, you see the postcard from the outside. And then when you get there, you're like, it's OK. This is, wasn't quite what I was uh, thinking it was going to be. Like uh, we just this morning bought um, airline tickets to London. We're going to go visit London in, in March. Oh, cool. And uh, I think my girlfriend has this sort of Victoria in London in her head that I know it's not going to be when we get there. Uh, but the more you travel, the more you find out that, uh, the, the postcards don't necessarily exist in, in most places. Um, but sometimes the places are even more interesting than that. Like I know London is more interesting than, than the Victorian postcard. Chicago, I find is a very interesting city that I haven't quite cracked yet as far as what that city's about, you know, so there's, that's always out there. That's why I like to tour is because I like to, I mean, most of the reason I tour is so I can go see some of these other places and, and get out and experience the world a little bit and get paid while I'm doing it. And a lot of times that's even in cities I would never have thought to go to that are are fairly interesting on their own or that aren't interesting on their own. And you just go, well, OK, all right, I've been to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I don't necessarily need to come here again. I think Fort Wayne you could see in a day. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> I think so. Chicago, you mentioned. I like Chicago. I think it's a great, the Love food Chicago. is awesome. And I thought the people yep. were really friendly and nice. Uh, I didn't want to go there in the winter again, but if you can go in the spring or the summer, it's, it's pretty cool. The, the, I almost always end up there in the winter. I'm actually going next month. And, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I've gotten used to it. Cause for some, the, the weird thing in comedy, I guess in, in entertainment and usual in those parts of the country is that the winter is the better time to tour through there. Because when you go in the summer or in the spring, when the weather's nice, nobody goes to shows because they all want to go do outside stuff. Well, that makes sense. And it was, yeah. Yeah. And it was the strangest thing. Cause I, I'm in California. If it drizzles, you know, nobody wants to do anything outdoors. And so we, um, I mean, or I mean, not even outdoors. They don't want to leave the house. So, I mean, in December or November, when it's raining in California, it's impossible to get people to come to shows. And the first time I showed up at a club and they were like, oh, yeah, it's raining out. We should have a good audience tonight. I was like, what? I don't what? I don't get that. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a, yeah, it's a different kind of market out there. And I just go, OK, so I'm going to end up in Chicago in the winter every year. It makes sense, though, because there is a limited time when people want to be outside. Yeah, I think I'd rather be in a club when it's cold outside. Okay, well, you've got a song for us, uh, which is yep. called Look Here. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the song. Uh, well, the song came out of a, uh, a story where my girlfriend asked me if I, why, how come, if I'm a musician, how come I've never serenaded her? And, uh, so as usual, I will take something she would like me to do and absolutely ruin it as much as possible. <laughs> and you said that there's like a little bit of a intro to the song. Yeah, well, I mean, that's how I, I sort of got into doing stand-up was I started talking about the songs and giving them an intro before I played them, and the intros started to be jokey, and uh, and it just branched out from there. Yeah, so it's got a little bit that goes before the song. Okay, well, this is Phil Johnson, and look here. Anyway, uh, uh, the song I'm going to sing for, I was watching a movie with my girlfriend one night, and in the movie, this guy was serenading his lady, right? And my girlfriend goes, how come you never serenade me? You're a musician. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. And so the next morning, I got up real early. It was like a Saturday morning. I tiptoed into my office, and I got my, um, uh, my trumpet. <laughs> that, that I don't play very well. And I uh, tiptoed back into the bedroom, and I started blowing the crap out of the thing. And she went, oh, my God, what are you doing? I said, I'm serenading you. She said, never do that again. That's how you get out of doing stuff like that, guys. You don't have to, you don't have to do that ever again, uh, ever again. So I did write like a serenade kind of song, a real kind of, you know, singing up to the balcony, Romeo and Juliet kind of serenade. So I'm going to play that for you now. I'm going to tune my guitar first. And uh, that's better. All right. Uh, awkward edit. Here we go. <laughs> I probably will just leave all that shit in the show. I probably, that's how, that's how I tend to roll with it. Maybe I'll say something else in here so that we just never actually get to the song. That might work too. One more. You didn't think I was going to do it one more time, did you? You didn't, you didn't think I was going to do it one more time. I did it one more time. I stepped into your... Now I'm going to sing it in the wrong key. That's awesome. Oh, you know why? Because it was the wrong chord all the time. That was the whole... It was the wrong chord all the time. It is actually in the key of E, not A. I... Uh, You'd think I rehearsed or something. <laughs> I stepped into your yard at 2.35 a.m. A guitar strapped to my shoulder, a little pebble in my hand. A small tap gets your attention, and the first notes of my serenade begin. And I sing, look here. Deep into my eyes, let the love that's in your heart flow over me. Just look here, no way, don't go away. Just listen to my words and what I'm trying to say. While my friend sneaks in your back door and steals all your stuff. The dragon noise you hear is just your couch being carried off. And when you wake in the morning and everything is gone, maybe you'll reconsider having thrown my stuff on the lawn. So look here, you 
went on the attack Just because the toilet paper faced front instead of back So look here, this payback's overdue I took the toilet paper and the toilet too And when you think about me later with bile in your heart I'll be thinking about you buying all new shit at Walmart Thanks All right. Well, that was super. That was extremely funny. And I love the bit at the beginning. I think it just added, you know, so much to the song. The toilet paper line was really clever. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> and, and actually the whole song was very clever because the lyrics sort of snuck up on you. Uh huh. You know, one of the marks of a good song is to not be able to predict what the next line is going to be. Because typically right. they rhyme, not always, but like in traditional songwriting, it's da 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 you know? And right. with yours, okay, I was expecting a rhyme, but I had no idea where it was going to go. And, <laughs> and and the element of surprise was the humor for me. Yep. You know, I mean, the line was funny too, but just the idea that, oh, ha, <laughs> toilet, yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so very clever. Yeah, really, it's well done. Thanks. It, what I what I often try to do is I'll make the um the rhyming word that needs to be in there will be something that might be expected that rhyming word, but whatever comes right before it is actually the joke, which is not necessarily great joke writing if I were doing stand up, because in stand up you want that that turn that x that that perfect word to be right at the end of the sentence. But I find I have to do it a little bit differently with the songs in order to get past that expectation a little bit. Well, it worked. It worked very well. So it's Thanks. called Look Here. Now, is that available? Can people buy that song or uh, listen to it? Absolutely. Somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. That one is, that one's from my, uh, my latest comedy special called Pretty from the Back. And, uh, it's on, uh, everything Spotify, Amazon, iTunes, my website, philjohnsoncomedy.com. It's, yeah, anywhere where you can get, uh, music and comedy, it's there. Is it the whole show or is it just the song? That yes. People can okay. So you. Uh, no, it's the whole show. Yeah. Yeah. That album is a whole, it's a, I think an hour and 15 minute show altogether. What do you charge for that? Oh, uh, I suppose it depends on where they're getting it from. But, uh, uh, I think on my website, the, uh, the, the download version of it is, I don't know, 10 bucks. And I think the DVD hard copy version is 20, if I remember right. Can't okay. remember exactly. No, because I've never actually seen download or I've never gone to see download comedy. You know, oh, okay. I've seen movies, you know, that you can rent for four ninety nine, and people are streaming songs for a penny on Spotify. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. But but comedy wasn't it's anything a, I've ever yeah. Yeah, an independent filmed production like that is a little bit tricky to get the distribution on. Uh, like uh, for if you go to iTunes, that's the audio version only. Um, but the way I distribute it through my website is I use Bandcamp and you buy the audio version of it and I throw in the video version of it with it as a bonus file. Um, so that way you get both of them. Cause I always like to have, you know, people, some people just want to listen to it in their car or whatever. Um, but what's actually been cool lately is Amazon has their video direct program now, which is, uh, they, they scooped off everything that they had in create space and put it in video direct. And so anybody that's got a prime account with Amazon can watch video direct for free pretty much. And there's rentals and there's downloads and there's all sorts of stuff, uh, along those lines. And so I've been getting a lot of people watching it on Amazon lately. Well, Phil, thank you for coming on the show. We are out of time. Thanks for having me. You're going to London, you said in March, right? Yeah, that's just a vacation. I might find a way to do a set or two while I'm there, but my girlfriend will hate me if I do too many. So uh, <laughs> that's just a vacation. But uh, uh, I'm coming up. I'm going to be in Oregon and Washington uh, next week, the week of October 10th. And then uh, I'm doing uh, some California dates the following week. And then I'm off to Florida at the end of October. And then I go to uh, Wisconsin and the Chicago area in November, uh, Southern California in December. Lots and lots of tour dates. Always, always, always. Oh, sounds like you're busy. Well, that's good. In this business, yep. busy is good, and sometimes it's a godsend. That's right. Not all actors are working, and not all yep. comedians are working. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thanks again, Phil, for coming on. I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed your song, too. Very funny. So glad to hear it. Thanks for having me. Well, that's about all the time we've got for the show today. I want to thank my special guests, Michael Pang and Phil Johnson. 
This is Douglas Coleman saying goodbye. Do them